good morning. Um, <coughs> so the, the last lecture I talked um, about the lethal theory. <coughs> but this is on yesterday, just to remind you of the form of it. <coughs> the um, simplest way to describe a uh, BCF excitons or a BCS like instability of the uh, Fermi surface of um, nearly nested um, electrical pairs is with the BCS like rate, which is just a variational function of this form. Um, and we went through quite a bit of discussion about that, about how you do it and what the steps meant. Um, I want to now spend a little bit of time. And then the last thing I came to with that was, in fact, a typical phase diagram you could expect as a function of density, or, of course, a fixed density as a function of interaction between the weak coupling of it, then the high density, and the strong coupling of it, then the low density. And this is the, the generic phase diagram for the mean field level for interacting with any body systems. And, of course, this works for superconductivity too because that theory is basically the same as this kind of plane that earlier. Now, um, uh, this lecture I think is going to be spent on trying to think about what would be the experimental consequences of something like this. Um, and for that, I will start to uh, need to remind you about some things that have been left out. Um, in a superconductor, um, you have a uh, situation, of course, where you have pairing between electrons uh, and you cannot convert an up spin electron into a down spin electron. There is no matrix element that will mix the two. Um, when you make the mapping, if you like, of the superconductor into a charge density wave, you replace the spin up by a hole, again imagining that it is an independent particle uh, that cannot turn back into an electron. Of course, that's not true if you have a multiband um, system. Um, these are all just electrons, and you can actually have a transition which will take you from one band to another, and that means that the numbers of electrons and the numbers of holes are not separately conserved. Oh, that's not in the Hamiltonian that I wrote down. Where would it come from? Well, there are no, two ways. So, let's go to bismuth, for example where you have a conduction band that looks like this and a valence band that looks like that. Um, and it is, of course, possible, in this case, these are at states which are at different momenta in the zone, and therefore you cannot make a transition of a single particle from one pocket to the other, because that requires you to get momentum from somewhere. Of course, you can do it with a phonon. <coughs> but of course, what you can do is that you can swap a pair. So you could have a terminal across from there and come back. More trivially, suppose uh, these two states were at k equals zero, um, then they would really be overlapping, like this, they would meet at the Fermi energy, um, and uh, unless there were special conditions of, sy of symmetry, <coughs> for example, um, which you do have in some, in, in some systems, uh, characteristic in graphene, uh, uh, these two bands would mix there would be a single particle matrix element which would allow you to tunnel between there and there. And of course, that will automatically generate a gap. So in this case, you will have a, uh, a matrix element just hopping, which can convert uh, a, a, a valence hole um, into an electron. In this case, you will have a Coulomb-driven coupling, which will look somewhat back down the bottom. It's sort of the generic uh, set of eigenstates, Coulomb interactions, which will allow you to mix bands. I mean, this is just what you would write down in general Coulomb interaction, and then you have to decide which terms are allowed by looking through here, uh, getting the band in season and momentum combination. So let's add either one or the other terms and see what happens, of course. Um, so if you have something that looks like this, of course, the first thing that you do is you would just re the Hamiltonian um, into new bands, and we will call them alpha and beta. And they'll just be linear combinations of those. That by itself will introduce a single particle gap, which will already exist. Um, but you have, uh, but so you have a new spectrum, 
Um, and the, then, of course, if you put back in the Coulomb term, you will generically get terms of the order of, well, I'll call V sub 1 because it's the energy, but it also depends on T, linear in the hopping, if, the, if you have a linear hopping term which is allowed, which is the form alpha dagger, alpha dagger, alpha beta. Or terms of this form, and this is the pair hopping term, uh, alpha dagger, alpha dagger, beta, beta. Notice that this isn't a density density, this is not alpha dagger, alpha beta, beta, beta. This is a term which in fact involves the cross term, alpha dagger, beta, and this one also involves an alpha dagger, beta here, linearly. Now, remember that the broken symmetry order parameter of, uh, of, of your excitonic insulator was an expectation value of A dagger C, A, B, or for that matter, alpha dagger, beta. So if you take these two terms, um, uh, this one, of course, generated only if you have this form of hopping, but this one will occur generically, um, you will get, uh, um, even in the, uh, just the expectation value of the broken symmetry Hamiltonian, you will generate terms of the energy which depend on the order parameter in ways which depend on the order parameter phase. Um, so the straightforward one is if you just have um, an electron hole layer with the pockets that are of the same energy, so some kind of artificial 2D semi-metal, um, or for that matter, quantum kind of bilayers, where tunneling between the layers produces a symmetric and anti-symmetric splitting, you will get a leading order term in terms of the complex order parameter, amplitude and phase, where this term introduces something which is linear in the order parameter, and it depends specifically on the phase um, and will be uh, referenced to some phase phi zero, which just depends on the band structure matrix element. So the point is there's a hopping matrix element, there's a tunneling matrix element from one layer to the other, and that tunneling matrix element has a well-defined phase. You just calculate it from the band structure. That's phi zero. Even if you don't have this term, the pair tunneling term, which I'll point out, has notice that this is alpha dagger beta, alpha dagger beta, so this is delta times delta plus emission conjugate. This is not delta times delta star, so you have from this... It doesn't like to be pressed too often, I think. Um, so, you, so you have from this term something which depends, again, on the phase of the order path. So firstly, both of these terms break the U1 gauge symmetry. Um, this term at least is quadratic in the order parameter, and what this is, is of course, this is a Josephson-like coupling term. Um, it fixes the phase and will produce a gap in the gold standard. So this will allow you to have a phase transition, but the phase transition will not be XY-like, it will just be pointing like and there will be a gap. Now, of course, the gap might be very small if V2 is small. So if the tunneling is weak, uh, or if the... Uh, 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 possibility of pair hopping is weak, and that's just the parameter, it's going to be a small effect, and of course it is actually a symmetry breaking one. This one, of course, gives you, produces a gap in the spectrum at all temperatures, because this is just a bad structure. So this, in this case, um, there's not even a phase transition. If you like, the order parameter delta always exists, even at high temperatures. You may go down to low temperatures, it may be enhanced by uh, correlation effect. Um, but this is just a band structure. Um, so actually, um, there's no properties to distinguish this phase from a normal dielectric. And so that is why this is called an axitonic insulator. So in principle, unless these terms are very small so that they can somehow be neglected, they're already there. And actually, these things are simply better referred to as a commensurate charge density. Um, <coughs> uh, because Another way of looking at these things, even though I was talking about Q equals zero and there was no density modulation whatsoever, all of these things in fact feed off all clap terms in the Hamiltonian. So that when you have the onset of this, you will actually have a weak density, a weak change in the density modulation, uh, which has the periodicity of the lattice. Um, so it's not a superfluid. I mean, it might be nearly a superfluid, which you understand what nearly means. Peter, where does phi zero come from? So phi zero, so phi zero here literally comes from the fact that you have, uh, you know, when you do a band structure with two bands, 
as a Hopping matrix element, and that comes with a, you know, that, that is a complex number. Okay. From the, from the, just well, from we the know, so, so it has a very, so it actually has a very, it's usually a real number. So, so in this case, phi zero will usually be zero or yeah. phi. It won't be, but I, mean, I can imagine exotic ways of choosing a different number. But the point is, it's a, it's a fixed parameter. You just do a band structure calculation, you get the same. You just get, okay. um, so, um, so, <coughs> so we'll come back to this in a moment when we think about the experiments that you might do. But this is. Actually, important. This is, I mean, this is, by the way, part of the discussion we had yesterday evening with a um, nice answer from me, I think, on this. Um, let me answer this. So let me now move to um, uh, Hanky with Noah. Um, so, now, <clears throat> particularly if I'm making excitons out of equilibrium, the idea is you, know, if you have the optical excitation above the band gap, you create excitons just below the band gap. And the term that I left out, um, which would allow them to recombine, in that case involves emission of a photon. Um, uh, now, this, of course, this, well, this page will immediately convince you that you can't ignore photons in the problem. But let me just assume that, that when those photons are emitted, um, uh, they leave the system. Now, the order parameter here, uh, ADAC CAB um, is actually in a, in a semiconductor like gallium arsenide, because you can couple directly to the dipole moment, um, is in fact a macroscopic uh, polarization. So if you generate the expectation value of this, what that means in the position I gave you is that these spins are all processing together. But in this case, they would carry a dipole and the dipole, uh, dipole could radiate a field. So that tells you, actually, if you really want to solve this problem right from the start, you should start with polaritons. You should mix the electrons and the photons. But let me ignore that um, for a moment, and actually probably to the whole of this lecture, because I won't get there. Um, uh, the, um, um, necessarily, however, the fact is if you created something like this, you do have a macroscopic dipole, and it will radiate um, uh, superradiantly, if you like. So the, now, so the k equals zero component of this of this order parameter, or so the q equals zero component of this order parameter, it's a sum of k, it's a macroscopic dipole, means that if you look at light emission, the light emission will come out with photons uh, which have zero momentum in the plane, and therefore they will be beamed straight out of the sample, straight at you. If, however, you look at a small angle, what you will discover is photons emitted from uh, excitons with a finite momentum. And if you measure the distribution of uh, <coughs> momentum distribution of photons, um, you'll get some kind of distribution here, which will actually simply tell you um, n of k, the occupancy in the uh, excited eigenstates. Okay. So if this was just bose like this is what you'd expect. So one of the nice things then about the system that tells you is that by looking at luminescence, particularly in 2D, you could then directly measure N of K in your dilute Bose gas. So one of the classic things that people have always tried to do in helium, by the way, is of course to measure N of K. It's very hard to do that. Um, in these systems, it's a straightforward experiment. You can measure N of K. Um, so actually, what do you then expect? the angular profile of the light emission, however, and it turns out to be pretty tricky. So the first thing is that if I'm in 2D, I'll imagine I have a finite size spot, which is occupied, um, and now I want to understand how that spot will radiate as a function of angle. Because it's 2D, the transition, of course, here will be constellate stars. What that means is that there will, of course, although there will be a phase transition at some finite temperature, there will be no long range order in this thing. So this thing, um, uh, except for t equals zero. Um, <coughs> when you're radiating the light, this is now like an antenna, so what you've really got is you've got a blob of stuff, and it has sound waves in it. And the sound waves are the, are the Goldstone lights. Um, if the uh, if you excite wavelengths of order the sound waves, which are of order the wavelength of light, that will dephase the emission of 
across the dot. And you will get no coherent light. Uh, so what that tells you then is that you need to go to very low temperatures in order to get a sharp peak. So here is a kind of calculation done by Jonathan Keating a while ago of a typical kind of spot. If you had a uh, um, transition temperature around 1 Kelvin in a trap size of about 10 microns, so um, cost of status is about a Kelvin. Um, however, if you want to look for the optical emission as a function of angle, you see this peak developing. Notice the temperature scale on here, 0.01 K, 0.05.1. And the reason for that, of course, is that it's not until the order power is spread across the whole of the dot that you begin to see coherent emission. So, um, so in this case, you need to go um, one to two orders of magnitude down below, and so n is just the number of particles. You need to go to order of magnitude down below the transition temperature, of course, to measure long range ordering or dot on the, way, on the scale of the wavelength of light. Um, so, uh, so, basically, the thoroughly excited phase fluctuations, once they reach the size of the droplet, they suppress the emission. Um, so, um, uh, now there was a question, I think, last night about uh, moisture effect. Okay? Um, you can, however, have vortices, of course, in this system. It's perfectly possible that as it condenses, it condenses with finite angular momentum. And you can ask, what would happen uh, to the light emission um, uh, if there was a vortex in it? And actually, that's quite nice because actually you can do, uh, it just turns out to be just really, uh, so this is the light emission as a function of angle. This is the spot, this is the position of the vortex. Um, it's basically a Fraunhofer pattern rotated through 90 degrees. Uh, and so what you can see is that you move this dot around. By looking far field, you would be able to see there was a vortex. If you had a vortex lattice, it would show up in far field as well. Okay. Um, so again, in principle, um, if you have uh, you know, vortices, which of course are demonstrating, again, another aspect of a phase coherence and rigidity in these systems, you would be able to see the optical emission. As I say, you're going to need to go to temperatures which are very low in comparison the transition temperature. So that's one reason, by the way, that I'm quite skeptical of some of the recent reports of coherent luminescence uh, uh, in these things, because the, the, it doesn't seem to me that the temperature is low enough for the panels to be. What other experiments could you do? Um, so we discussed a little bit about the fact that there is no... Uh, um, uh, <coughs> suppose you could drive the system, is there a superfluid response? Well, there's no charge and there's no mass. There are thermal currents. But actually, in the bilayer, you have a static dipole, and therefore it's possible to make a. Uh, um, uh, to, 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 uh, to drive this with a magnetic field which is in the plane. Um, and the way it goes is like this. So imagine that you've got you know, electrons and holes, so there's a dipole through here, and you apply a magnetic field which is in the plane. Again, this was an experiment which was. Uh, uh, discussed uh, yesterday by Lydia, um, um, and analyzed actually a long time ago, um, before recent papers which don't seem to have read the ancient Russian literature, but never mind. Um, so apply a magnetic field um, and apply it in the plane, and it's useful to think about having a time-dependent magnetic field, and, and you'll see why. Um, this is Maxwell's equation, of course. That tells you that curly is minus dB by dt. And so by having a time dependent field in the plane, you produce an electric field which rotates about that. And of course, the electric field is pointing this way on this plane and this way on the other plane. And the effect of doing that, of course, is that because the charge is in the opposite direction, that will move the dipole backwards and forwards. So again, you would image, you'd be looking at this spot and you would image it, and you're now going to oscillate it backwards and forwards. If you go down to DC, you'll be moving it and trying to generate a supercurrent. But we're looking at the dynamic optical response. So here's the force, 10 to the mega. Uh, D is the separation, Q is the charge. Then you've got, of course, a dipole current, which, is, which you would see as a displacement in here, uh, uh, proportional to uh, the applied force. I will call that a uh, dipole conductivity. Um, and what will it look like? Well, actually, of course, 
it will have exactly, you know, in, uh, in the case of a superfluid, in the case of a dipole superfluid, it will have exactly the kind of response you would expect in the superconductor, namely that the real part will have a delta function piece, and the imaginary part will have a 1 over omega piece, and of course this is superconductivity and this is Meissner. Um, uh, so, um, you do an AC experiment, and what you would expect to measure would be the outer phase response. Meister-like response is a 1 over omega peak in here, and if you went down to DC, um, you'd expect to see uh, the delta function peak. And again, the way you would do this is that you would simply be applying this kind of magnetic field, and you would be imaging the spot, so you could see it move. And what, of course, you want to do is you want to make sure that you can see a response which is uh, uh, which is inertial rather than resistive. Um, now, what about tunneling work on this experiment? So I said this isn't really a superfluid, right? So there's some tunneling matrix element. That tunneling matrix element produces a gap. Suppose it's small, what does it do? It produces a pinning frequency. It will shift the response up to a hopefully small frequency. Uh, and, but nonetheless, there still should be above that the 1 over omega, because rather than going singular, it will, it will round over. Um, and if this reminds you of the response of a charge density wave, it should. Uh, because that's exactly what charge, any charge density waves do. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, so these these are directly related to the charge density wave. It is a charge density wave where the wavelength of the charge density wave is Q is zero. <coughs> so it's infinite. Q equals zero CDW. These effects associated with here is of course that Q equals zero is also the same as Q equals G, which produces. Uh, um, uh, okay, so that's a little bit of a, um, uh, now I've got 10 minutes, something like that. Uh, so, okay, you, you, so you, you have two choices, right? I can either talk about this problem, um, or I can tell you something very quickly about experiments on polaritons, but. Okay, <laughs> you want this one. So the, the, uh, uh, so this, so, so now so everything up to this point has just been about uh, equal densities. Um, uh, what happens if you have unequal densities? What happens if you have more electrons, say, than holes? Um, then you face a problem um, which is uh, very closely related to uh, um, full Ferrell in a uh, super. Um, and the reason being is that, so here are my two bands, this is, this is the electron band, this is the whole band, and I've got unequal densities by putting the chemical potential in the wrong place. The system fundamentally then has two choices, as you know. You can say, well, I still want to be a superconductor. Um, and so that means that I nest here, um, and I produce a gap there, but I've got some carriers left over, and I will put them in the other band. So this is exactly like a magnetized superfluid. <coughs> Where, where the, um, and of course, the way you would relate this to a superconductor, the difference between this is that, of course, if I flip these bands about the chemical potential, um, this was the up and this was the down band, um, and so in a superconducting pairing language, this is just like applying a magnetic field to a superconductor. The other possibility, however, is that you realize that if you were to displace one of these curves, you could get it to nest on one side, and since actually in higher dimensions, this is, a, this, this is actually two uh, spheres kissing, it turns out to lower the energy typically to do this, um, because you get to open up a gap here that gives you some energy, it doesn't do you any good over here, but this hurts less than that gains you. It does of course cost you kinetic energy because you're doing a condensation of finite momentum pairs. And this is uh, Fulton Farrell, Larkin, and Finikov. Um, so, <clears throat> so one can, and, and exactly the same um, physics could arise here. Um, now, what's different? Well, what's different is uh, you know, some of the details of the forms of the interaction. Um, and and this, this has been a, a, a thing which, of course, has also been much discussed in uh, cold atoms. I think actually cold atoms has turned, turned out to be 
something of a red herring. And the reason is that cold atoms are actually neutral. And there is, of course, something else you could do with a system like this if you were allowed to separate your particles. You could, say, you could have your superconductor, and then you could take these electrons over here and decide to put them over somewhere else in the physical space. So we face them. So in cold atoms, if you well, the neutral cold atoms, generically you can do that. And so cold atoms, in fact, most of the time, uh, find ways of phase separating rather than going into full drone. But the nice thing, of course, about working with charged particles is you can't do that because that costs you long-range electrostatic energy. And so phase separation is strongly suppressed. Um, uh, so I'll... So, so how would you describe this? And actually, I want to discuss this rather in the, rather in the full of real language, is that there are some difficulties here. Well, I mean, you can do that, and people have done that. Um, there's another interesting way of looking at the problem. This, I think it's an interesting way of looking at the problem. But, but first, you just to remind me, what's the Hamiltonian that I'm going to use? Same one I've used before. It's a bilayer. It's got, uh, uh, let, so the layer index um, becomes here a spin index, but it's one and two. I've got interlayer Coulomb and intralayer Coulomb. And so, of course, the interlayer Coulomb is, is, is weaker, uh, and uh, Q is the wave vector, and D is the separation between the particles. So this isn't scripting. Although, actually, the moment I will introduce scripting. Um, now, <coughs> now, rather than considering a system which is actually relatively uh, uh, complicated with both electrons and holes, it's actually worth thinking about what happens if you took a system of uh, all spin one particles and then added two more. One in one layer and one in the other. So this is a situation where if you like, I've got a Fermi C of one species and then I add on top of that one more particle hole pair. So where would you need to be in a superconduction in the phase diagram to do that? You need to add H to two. So if you go to the uh, uh, Pauli paramagnetic limit, so you're at a point where there's sort of one band left, and then you just drop the other band down um, so that there's one particle left over. Um, and it's sort of an analog of the Cooper problem, if you like, superconductor. So I've got one, so I've got all, I've got a Fermi, sur Fermi surface line now, I can add two more particles. Um, the question you would like to ask then is uh, firstly, when you add those particles, does it bind? Does it form an exciton? If it binds, does it bind with an exciton whose center of mass momentum is zero or five? Okay. So that's a variational wave function you can write down on top of this Fermi C, species one. Um, you're restricted to adding particles which are outside it, so the momentum of the uh, uh, relative momentum of the pair have to be greater than Kf, because you can only put particles in K greater than Kf. But the hull could go either into the um, relative zero momentum state, so that Q equals zero, it could go into finite Q. And the point about that, of course, is that, is that um, uh, because, the, because the interaction strength here has some momentum dependence in particular, and also that there, there are advantages, if you like, of getting the electron and hole as close together in momentum space as possible. But in order to do that, you pay the kinetic energy of the whole by promoting it to a finite wave. So then at the center of mass momentum, this thing is moving. So let's get the question is, do you get a bound state, do you not get a bound state, and then what's the cube of the lowest set? And so this is actually something that just came out of you. Um, so, well, so here's the answer. Um, it uh, depends, uh, so alpha is the mass ratio. So I'm sorry about this. So we have various parameters in here. Everything's measured in terms of Bohr radii, RS as before. Uh, layer separation, one more radius, um, and this is mass ratio of electron to hole. So this is a heavy hole. Sorry, this is a heavy hole. This is a light hole. Wrong way around. This is a heavy hole. This is a light hole. Um, uh, and here's the wave vector which it binds, again measured in, in, in uh, uh, or ADI. And what do you get? Well, actually, if the density is too high, the Fermi energy is too big, the Fermi momentum is too big, um, uh, you're forced 
to add everything at the, uh, at the Fermi wave vector, but it doesn't bind. Um, and so this dotted line actually is K. If, however, the density is very low, um, then K has become very small, it's favorable to get the momentum very close, which means that Q is equal to zero, and you get uh, the spin pole, and, and you get the Q equals zero, zero. Then in between, you get a state where the pair goes into a finite momentum, and what it does is it, there's a transition here, it comes up, and then it joins up uh, at the uh, state boundary here. And you can plot this in various ways. And as a, uh, this is uh, as a function of RS and mass ratio, and this is the, something else. And this is sort of what the phase diagram looks like. And so again, generically, just as in a uh, expected in a um, um, regular uh, superconductor, um, in the vicinity of the transition from the superfluid phase to the normal phase, you expect something which is called finite momentum. Now, by the way, I'm calling this FFLO. And you say, how do you know that you added only one particle? So, of course, that is an interpretation. What is the basis on, you, on which you would make that interpretation? And it comes back to thinking about the form of the wave function like constructed. Um, uh, because, of course, it should be clear that I've had one particle. When I say I add, uh, I, I add something at the, at the Fermi momentum, Q is equal to 2KF. That could be anything at surface on a ring. So when I add a particle, it could go into it, it could go into any finite momentum state. And what I now need to know is what happens if I have a finite density of those things. And so that will be describing now this new state by a, by a complex field, which I call psi. Think of that as just a many-body generalization of the wave function in the same way that you would generalize a, 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 a O state. Um, there is clearly a quadratic term in the Hamiltonian which just controls whether the free energy is positive or negative. And so that is tuned by a chemical potential, so tor. Um, you know, this is tor is energy minus chemical potential. And then we know that I just calculated for you that for uh, a given low order with interactions, um, there would be an instability which would set it at some way back to Q0. Q0 in this case is typically close to 2kf or it's just zero. So of course when q0 is zero, I'm just going to be writing down an ordinary uh, into a Landau theory of superconductor. And then when I have interactions, I need to think about what is the leading order term, which is allowed by symmetry, which can do this, and actually that's a this form. Um, you can't add a cubic term, you can't add anything which depends on phases entirely. Um, so you, so you actually have to end up with this kind of field theory uh, <coughs> to describe that. Um, this I know is the Brzozowski model. It is in classical physics. Uh, it's a well-known one where you have an instability to an instability to something which happens at finite Q. Um, but you don't know which Q. It's sort of relevant, for example, to, uh, uh, to symmetric phases. Um, but, um, so it's usually that gives first order condition because of fluctuation. Right, this indeed. So if I go a bit beyond this, I'm going to get a first order transition out of this. So no doubt about this. Right? So the, the, uh, um, if I were to just analyze this mean field theory, I just want to know what is the state which I may eventually end up with. Okay. Um, it turns out, actually, that it's kind of amusing. It is uh, a kind of full de Ferrel symmetric, sort of a double symmetric. Because it turns out that this is stabilized by two wave vectors. And there is nothing in this Hamiltonian to either tell you what the relative phases are, or in fact what the relative directions are. Um, so I have to say, so that, as was just immediately pointed out, if you really want to know what happens, you're going to have to go beyond this to understand the effect of fluctuations, and we haven't done that. But I just wanted to demonstrate here that it is natural now that you see that you get something which is it rather different you would find from a typical kind of full of Ferrell uh, state um, where you, know, you can have more, you can have no generic models which give you stripes or hexagons, and this is kind of a double stripe, but they overlap in complicated ways. And it's only when we go to analyze the fluctuation we have done it, we'll know what kind of state you get. What's the relationship between Q1 and Q2? There's none which is produced by this. Oh, no, that makes so a certain perpendicular or? Uh, 
Um, well, again, so, so, so there's a bizarre work, but I can go through it in detail. The answer is the answer is at this level. Of course, the modulus of, the modulus of them is the same. Uh, right. But but the, but the but the directions between them are, are, are not um, uh, are, are not fixed actually at this level of the model. Um, kind of bizarre, right? but, but um, yeah, that's what it does. Uh, but you do, but nonetheless you do, but nonetheless you, you do get two. So um, uh, so Daniel isn't paying attention because I don't know. But he was just being very. No, he was being very, very yeah, generous. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, uh, so, 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 okay. So this is so, so this is in fact really where I want to start. I mean, I, I, I said a few things uh, which I repeat here about systems, and, um, and I suppose I should just close actually by uh, thanking the people who did the work. So the work we've been doing on so students, heterostructures, most of which I didn't actually talk about, uh, being done particularly by uh, a student at Christo and Cambridge in collaboration. Uh, Emilio Artacho and with lots of help from Neil Lafour and uh, from Jim Scott. Um, there's some of the work we've actually been doing on Tin Telluride, where it's actually interesting, by the way, interestingly, Tin Telluride is in fact one of the least correlated materials you will ever find. The nice thing about it, so we did photo emission spectrum on Tin Telluride, and it agrees perfectly with the band structure down to about six volts. You can see all the bands, everything is there. If you just know what you know, it, 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 it's sort of extraordinary, actually. Um, uh, um, and a lot of the work on exotonic phases uh, done um, with, with uh, uh, Paul, Jonathan, Francesca, Mira, Marjana. Um, and actually, most recently, I will say, uh, with Richard, who's usually hiding somewhere in the corner of Boston. Um, uh, although that, that work with Richard is all actually to do with the diatons rather than this. And again, lots of experiments, particularly from David Stone, sample someone like that, and work with the diatons. So I should talk. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, I mean, we, um, so the first thing is that when you, when you do experiments on these bio systems in general, nobody is ever going to be able to produce match densities. So the question, so I, so I think it's, um, so, the, so, the, so the first thing I should say is that, you know, whether you get FFLO or whether you get a, a, a superfluid phase depends a great deal on the form of the interaction. If you do, actually what we, and I forgot to say what we did in there, one of the things that we did in these calculations, I apologize, uh, is that although I wrote down the bare interaction, uh, if you, have, you can evaluate the phase diagram with the bare interaction, and you can also choose your favorite screened potential, screened interaction to use, uh, which is a, in fact a more realistic thing to do, particularly when you're adding you know, one charged particle of electron gas, you better not use the bare interaction. If you use the screen interaction, you get a much larger range for FFLO. I mean, not surprisingly, if you just think about whether the interactions are so, so that that matters. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, mean I, don't think I, I don't think I've got a good answer, you know, in general, but FFLO phases seem to be, in some sense, more robust in these systems than they are in the other ones that we have been chasing after them. And certainly, certainly than in cold atoms. Well, I mean, cold atoms, they sort of disappear off into phase separated states. And here, because of using long range but screened interactions, they seem to be much more stable than they would typically be in superconducting state. Um, yeah. so, <coughs> yeah. Okay. How did I see that this is polarization? polarization? How did you see the piece of polarization? The reason, the reason you should see it, because I didn't write it down. I mean, I mean, I mean, like, I, I, I don't think it's possible to do a synaptic synaptic intervention. No, no, so, there, okay, so let me write down the term of Hamiltonian, which would which would fix this, right? So the thing is, if I have a, um, a, let me talk about, just about Gallimus. So hidden underneath the Hamiltonian model, which adjusts to these bands, is, of course, is that this is an S state, and this is a P state. So the block states underlying these things, 
um, had a dunk on it. So that means that the Hamiltonian mode has H0 plus H int, plus in terms of coupling to uh, a photon field, H bar omega k, psi omega k, psi k, so that's for the photons, then there will be a term which is uh, psi omega k, c dagger, well, psi, no, psi, psi dagger q, c dagger q minus q, uh, conduction. This, of course, is an electric field, and therefore this, of course, is a polarization. Right. Right. So, so this arises just because you're dealing here with a semiconductor where this is a dipole active transition. If this was cuprous oxide, where this was an S state, I don't have this term in the Hamiltonian. I have to go to higher order, either a two photon transition or a, a quadruple transition. Right. So there is so. So yeah, so the way you see that this is act that this order parameter is actually a polarization. Um, no, it's a zero dependent, but of course this is all living in the block states rather than in the ground states. So okay. Well I also have kind of a general question. Uh is uh for uh that uh due to this uh the charge which is placed, uh, actually, it's a tonic insulator, it's uh, no different from ground state or normal insulator. We simply just didn't really do a good job to start with. Yeah. And uh, we did a bad work and then uh, we did a bad story kind of fix it. Pay for it, but all this. Yeah. But in non equilibrium states, uh, 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 when you really excite a lot of these things, we may have something uh, more simple to the state. So, what about this? Still, some analog of filter properties. Of course, not really real filter fluidity, but still strongly enhanced uh, thermal conductivity or whatever. Hmm, sure. is, it, is it observed anywhere? No. Well, I mean, so the answer is, of course, it is. And it's called a charge density work. Right? So, so, so we have known for a long time. So you mean just early conductivity, yeah? Huh? Well, exactly. And then, so the answer is, you know, if you go to high fields, you overcome the pinning and the thing begins to slide. It also begins to dissipate. Uh, and um, and you know, dissipation is not something that I've talked about. And you need to think about dissipative processes when you go uh, to, to the non-equilibrium case. But indeed, you can, in again, in polaritons, where all this works, you can drive the system hard. Um, and, and you can produce non-equilibrium phenomena that look very much like a superfluid. If you look closely, you discover it looks a little bit more like a laser than a superfluid. The game has developed uh, phase coherence, but still has some remnant dissipative processes which are small. Now, is it done uh, in a particular system, like in a spin shell, something like spin density, so on equilibrium uh, magnums and uh, okay, spin, right. spin transfer? Okay. So, um, no, so, so, okay, so, so, okay, so there, there are experiments, and I forgot exactly who did them. You may be able to remember, because it's in Germany. Um, where, um, and this is uh, um, experiments on um, spin bikes in Yttrium Iron Garden. And in that, actually, so you've got spin waves here, uh, which if you take a thin film, um, of a magnet have a strange, strange dispersion relation. They come down and then they go up again. I forget the details of this, but this is associated with dipolar versus uh, versus Heisenberg interactions. Um, and it actually has been so. There's a minimum here, and it has been possible by pumping up here to basically have parametric scattering, which decays down here, and to develop coherence in this. Um, and then you can see um, macroscopic spin transport. So, um, do you remember who did these experiments? No, I, I did. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's somewhere about 100 miles north of you, I think. So, uh, okay. right. Now, so, so from this point of view, you say, gee, you know, this is really pretty exotic. Uh, however, one of the equations that you would use to describe this dynamics, they're very familiar. Uh, you know, you would just write down the ginsburg lando equations for magnetization prop propagation in a, in a magnetic film. So, uh, 
So you know, remember that the effect of having a superfluid is that it typically obeys you know, sort of classical looking <laughs> equation. Well, right. Exactly. That's right. okay. and so you can see that. Nonetheless, you can do it when you develop it coherently. And so there's a parametric gap conversion process where you sort of pump up here and you get states down there. Um, and these discover by themselves that they, that they should be phase converted. So, so indeed, so, that, so, so those kind of experiments do exist in a number of different contexts. Okay. Oh, by the way, I suppose the classic really one would say is in the, uh, I did mention it briefly, is the quantum ball bilayer. So the quantum ball bilayer, where each layer is half filled, Remember that the, remember that the half filling is supposed to be the most benign point of, a, of the quantum Hall effect. Right? That there's there's nothing. Well, I mean, I mean it's benign or, or, it, or it's exotic in terms of a strange Fermi description, but there's no quantum Hall physics there. It was discovered quite a while ago that if you had two nucleus half layers which were close enough together, not close enough to, to, to tunnel, but close enough to be Coulomb coupled, actually you got a quantum Hall like set. And that was explained, uh, and I think generally people regard that to be sort of the most accurate description by, you know, by a model of a ferromagnet with up being one layer and up down being the other one, and the ground state being an XY-like superposition, exactly the one that I was writing down before, this, um, this E to the sum over I and omega I and S I. Where, where, this, where this is spin up, this one is spin down. Um, uh, and there are, of course, experiments done on this, where you can couple to one layer and couple to the other layer, and you can drive currents along here, and you can see if you drive a countercurrent that way, and those experiments work. So there you really have um, uh, pretty solid evidence for superfluid-like transport. Now, you, know, you say, well, I mean, as I was pointing out, it can't really be a superfluid because there's a tunneling between this layer to the other, that tunneling will turn into a lens scale, and it turns out that the tunneling is weak enough that that lens scale is typically smaller than this characteristic size of the system. And therefore, on short enough lens scales, it looks like a superfluid. Eventually, it's not. It's going to dissipate. Because so I will have currents that will actually... The point is that here you put in a current in this direction, and it comes back out that way, and you don't want it to tunnel through. The tunneling is weak enough so that those processes are, 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 are typically irrelevant. So probably, I mean, that is, I think, the best, although a slightly exotic example uh, of an exotron condensate that anybody has produced. But that was actually very similar to what was proposed, for example, when I was a leak uh, yeah. on the Goyle. That's right, exactly. Two layers. Uh, the two uh, layers. Uh, electron and uh, other core, you, you drive kind of, uh, they go together. Right. But currents go for it. Sure. Right. So, right. So, so, the, uh, so, those, so those, by the way, so those, exper so those experiments have been done on uh, electron hole bilayers produced in Cambridge and produced in San Diego. Um, and some of that data is published, but they make no noise about it. They do see odd effects which happen at low temperatures, but they've, un but they've not yet been able to get something which obeys on operations. Uh, so they're not confident that they really know what they've done. Um, and, and so you know, watch that spot as well, because people are working on Technologies that actually have having these systems with, with contacts. Okay. So I don't see any more questions, so let's thank Peter once again.